Hi, I'm Amber. And I'm Jessie. And this is Glowing in Tech. Powered by Coding Black Females. If you're on YouTube, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. And if you're on Spotify or Apple, be sure to click on the notification button so you don't ever miss out on an episode. And also please leave us a review. If you enjoy what you listen to, then we would love to hear any thoughts and opinions. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we're joined by the iconic, the marvellous Tara Ojo, who's a software engineer at Google. Tara, we'd love for you to do your tech topic in 10 now. And mm -hmm. that's an opportunity for you to do a little bit of a lightning talk to introduce a topic to, in 10 minutes or less, hopefully, um, <laughs> to people who might not know about the technology or the specific area that you're going to talk about. So over to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I found it hard to pick a topic that I still knew about. Because like <laughs> prior to Google, I knew stuff. After Google, I don't know anything, just, <laughs> just a tiny bit of Java now. Mm -hmm. But there is one thing that has been crucial throughout the whole of my career, and that's um, version control yeah. and Git and GitHub. And what previously, when I think I did my first, like, first coding role was subversion, SVN, which is even more confusing than Git. <laughs> Thank goodness nobody uses that anymore. Wow, I've not even heard of it. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it is. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Died out a bit long ago. Um, but yeah, I learned about Git more on my grad scheme because I was just so confused about what people were asking me to use it for. So I did an online course, I think on Pluralsight, and it gave me all of the foundations that I needed to just help me do my job. So I want to talk about mainly why it's important and what are some very opinionated best practices when using it because I think every company just does it so differently um but for people that don't know what Git is I'll attempt to explain it without any diagrams or code or <laughs> any visuals at all since we're on a podcast um but so I'll explain it in the context of being an author of a book so when you're trying to write generally, or write a book, you are not going to do it all in one setting. You'll attempt to do it bit by bit. So you'll maybe add a paragraph and the next day add another paragraph or the next day add a whole page. And then maybe you go back and rewrite parts of it. And each change kind of depends on the last change that you made. And they all happen in a sequence of steps, like every day you're changing something. But when you start to make it a little bit more complex, when you trying to do alternate things. So let's say we wanted to add an alternate ending to the book. So now I have two copies of the same book, but two different endings. And if I want to go back and change the start of the book, I now have to maintain both of these books that will have two different endings. And that can get like a little bit more complex, like keeping two versions of the same thing in sync. So maybe you're copying and pasting one into the other or trying to like do some merge situation. Uh, it just can be a bit messy and code is exactly the same. So instead of your alternate ending to different books, you're maybe experimenting with a new feature. And Git enables you to manage all of those different versions of code. So back to the book example, if you decide you actually want to have two authors of the book, so there's me and my co-author trying to create this book together, the strategy you could take is to have one main version of this book and then you and your co-author take a copy of the book so you both have your own copies and work on that independently. And then you decide if you're both happy with it, then it goes into the main version of the book which is probably fine if you're editing different chapters, different pages. But again, it gets complex when you're trying to edit maybe the same sentence. And like going back to code, Git enables you to manage all of the different complexities with dealing with code conflicts when you're both trying to change the same area of the code base. And when you throw in thousands of developers for some companies like Google, this can get so complex that Git really helps can help um, you to manage that, that collaboration. So there is a pretty uh, common version control workflow that Git and version control helps you to do, but it can still be confusing, especially when you have all of those devs like causing loads of conflicts with each other. Mm -hmm. But I think managing Git can be so much easier when you follow some rules, which I guess some people call Git hygiene. And when you make each change in 
get, you, you call that commit. So when I talk about commits, it's just a change. So one of the rules is about making sure every commit works. So you can't introduce commit that breaks something with the intention to fix it in your follow-up commit, including uh, tests too. So when you have a commit, you write the code that you need for that change and you add your tests with it. Because when you want to revert to an old version, you don't want to accidentally revert to something that's broken and then you're in an even worse state than you were when you started. I think uh, another important rule is around making small changes. So this has to be within reason. So it's not just like making one line change in every commit, but making your complete working change as small as possible in one commit. And there are so many benefits to that, mainly that it's so much quicker to get things reviewed. Sometimes I get hit with a a pull request in the past that's so massive that I have to like break it down into chunks of time just to go through and review it. So and just had, quickly, what's a pull request? And a pull request is a series of commits where someone's like, I'm ready for you to look at this change um, and then make it into the official version of the code. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, the smaller commits are quicker to get reviewed they are usually reviewed more thoroughly so mm. when somebody has this huge change because it's harder to check everything and think about every possible um case of failure you usually just get the okay yeah looks good <laughs> looks good to me lgtm <laughs> lgtm whereas <Fire> emoji. <laughs> <laughs> whereas when it's much smaller you are more likely to see potential issues or whether to see if it's going to introduce bugs. And that then makes your code quality much better because you're getting better feedback on it. Um, and it's easier to just merge and roll back if any issues do come up mm -hmm. because not everything in your change is related to different things. It's just related to one thing. And... One thing that I think is really useful is detailed commit messages, which mm. not many people seem to do just generally. You don't? Do you? I try my best. I'm just no. like, matches the design. <laughs> That's literally a commit I made yesterday. Okay, and now Tara's going to tell you why it's important it's not true. to... It's true, yeah. Because <laughs> commits like that, sorry, Amber. And, <laughs> and add tests or add feature or fix bug mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as... As much as they work, technically, they are not too useful to your future self. So I don't know about you, but when I come back to something I've done six months ago, I, I don't really remember why, why I did something in that way. But your commit message can be the opportunity for you to, to tell future developers for your future self why you're doing it. And that's so much easier when it comes to debugging. Mm -hmm. So the code that you're changing is the what and the how but your commit message is the why. So I usually have a short description of the change as my, my top line, and then maybe two paragraphs or something underneath detailing why I've done it. If I've done something weird that you wouldn't usually do, why I've done it that way. So if someone else is looking at it being like, I need to change this, you can easily quickly see why I've done it that way in the first place. And also links to maybe design docs, mm. um, that have come in that I've used to like write the code in the first place. And I worked in a company that did this, just, it was, they did it so well. I remember my first day and I was like, yeah, add feature, commit. They're like, yeah, no, we don't do that here. <laughs> <laughs> you have to add like more detail. And when it came to just figuring out like legacy situations, like why, why is this working like this? Can I delete it? You would usually be able to easily and quickly see a detailed description of why they had done it in the first place. Oh, right. Yeah, so you can be like, oh, okay, that's why they did it, but that's no longer relevant. I can change it, mm -hmm. or that's why they did it. If I change this the way that I was planning to, I'm going to break everything. Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, so helpful for just understanding in the future why things were done in the past. Yeah, so it's kind of like supplementing documentation, but with tied to the time it's added as well. Exactly. So that's really yeah. cool. Because... Oh, Sorry, I've got a question. Mm. So so you write paragraph commit messages or is this actually in the PR and the readme? No, commit messages, yeah. <laughs> okay, wait, okay. 
let me defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> because at a previous company I worked in, we had a maximum amount that you could write in a commit message. Oh, really? So it was actually like, I remember I was like, she was like, why are you having this much for a commit? Like you can only do a certain amount of words. Oh, wow. And because I've like, that was what I first started out with in my first mm. like commercial role. I'm thinking paragraphs in a commit message. <laughs> like, yeah, I could barely do like 15 words before. Yeah. So I was like encouraged to do sure. Yeah. So it's it's interesting to hear mm. that you're saying the, the opposite. opposite. And even in the old commit messages to make sure that you're not committing changes that are like, that don't pass the test, for example. Mm. Yeah, that's so, a really good one. But also one that I find incredibly tough to do. Because does that assume that you're doing TDD? So you're writing your, your tests first? Uh, not necessarily, but that can be helpful. But as long as you're writing your tests at the same time as you're writing the code that makes the change. I like for me, I'll change the functionality and then write the test afterwards. Mm. I tried mm-hmm. to do TDD, but I'm not that great at it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so carry on. But yeah. Um, so yeah, detailed commit messages. You should do that. I remember once, so I was the same when I did my first role. It was just, you write whatever you want, doesn't matter. Um, but in the second role is where they were like, be specific about why you're making the change. And they always would point to this one commit where I think they just added a comma in in the code somewhere. And the commit message was about a page long as to why why this change was made, why it's important, and why you should like never delete it or something like that. But Oh wow. Yeah, it's it's all documentation and yeah. because it's tied to the exact time and date when you made the change and the change, it doesn't go out as I, out of date yeah the way the number docs I've never do. even thought of it like that but what about squashing and merging yeah so that is my next one. Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, we, should, we, we probably shouldn't be doing that it's, <laughs> I mean it's a bit controversial everyone does things differently I'm sure the way that your companies work it's it's probably fine but you want to be able to tell a story with your commit messages. So mm-hmm. it's like when you glance through them, they're just a step-by-step instructions on how you did something. So like step one, create this new UI component. It's not being used by anything, but it's got all the tests, maybe adding it to you, um, like some sort of design library so people can use it. Step two, update the back end so you're getting the data required to use it. Step three, integrate it into the actual page where you want to use it you've got your component you've got your data just combine it together and then yeah one thing people sometimes do when they merge it into their main work is to squash everything together and then you lose (laughs) that history you do but instead you want to rebate so you've got like a timeline of how Uh, things work that's really interesting Mm. and so I can imagine that with that way you're talking about it of like having it as a set of instructions and you've got it step by step that would be so useful as a junior or someone learning exactly the process of going about building a new component yeah. or building a new API. Mm. Like it would be so cool to see exactly step by step how another engineer has done that thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm going to have to talk to other people about. <laughs> I have to do a whole session on it. <laughs> I love to learn. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, those are my like highly opinionated uh, steps oh, to it. working with Git, uh, which if you can get everyone in your team doing it or even everyone in your tech team, it makes just working with the code so much easier and better. That is really interesting. Mm-hmm. I've not heard. No, I haven't. I'm not. It's just, the thing is, it's so confusing because so many companies do it so differently. Yeah. Because yeah. there's no way my company one would be doing this. Yeah. I'm <laughs> like, there's... That was literally, it didn't allow you to go beyond a certain, that's wild. A certain character count. Mm. So yeah, yeah, that's re- that's re- extremely interesting. So where did you pick up these practices? Was it more encouraged by workplaces? And how would you advise people to communicate this new way to their team? That's a really good question. So when I moved to FutureLearn, that was just the way things were done. I think it was enforced or encouraged by leadership. So okay. people are more uh, willing to introduce it into their like ways of working. And when you started to see the benefits, like you, you just never want to look back. 
what's difficult is going into a company or a team where they've never done anything like that mm, and trying exactly. to tell them to do that, which is what I tried to do when I joined my team um, at the Finance Times. I shared a lot of resources on like other people saying it was good, so it wasn't just me. Um, talked a lot about how we can implement it and then attempted to always like comment on pull requests and commits that people wanted to change to say, oh, you could break this up into a couple of commits or maybe you could explain why it is you're doing it this way. Mm. I mean, usually you need to know as a reviewer anyway. So it makes sense to put it in the commit message for future people that are going to come to the code and ask the exact same question. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. I, don't, yeah. I never look at people's commits. Do you not? I never. I always do because I'm curious, like, because, you know, you can see, like, when tests fail and tests don't and, like, when they've fixed the test. And... Yeah, that's mm. it. Yeah, I literally just don't. I just, I just, I'm just like, let me look at what works. <laughs> <laughs> and so now it's, it's a whole new perspective to really actually pay attention to. Maybe it's because I know that my commits don't necessarily mean that much. Yeah. Mm. So when yeah. I'm committing, it's just like, um, okay, this matches the design, but something doesn't work. Mm. But I wanted to make sure that. I have this written down so I can just stash and go back to this version. Yeah. Do you see what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more like a like a safety net mm, that I create for myself yeah. each time mm -hmm. rather than something necessarily meaningful the way that mm. you're speaking about it. So that's definitely something that... Yeah, I want, I'm going to take this back to work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Just, <laughs> she, she definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I really want to hear the tech tea. Same. It's my favorite part of the episode. <laughs> what is the tech tea? Tara's going to be spilling the tea on something that she finds controversial within the tech industry. And I think it's about the glamorization of working in tech. Yeah. Yeah. Spicy. Spicy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this is just me or we'll maybe because out. I spend so much time on social media. But I feel like... People love to say how great it is about working in tech without talking about all of the terrible parts of working in tech. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I understand we've got a massive skills gap. We want to get more people from diverse backgrounds to join the tech industry to make things better. But, like, when you encourage people to do that, it's not always, like, big salaries and luxury life. <laughs> Yeah. There's also this just the stress that comes a part of it. And I think that was one of the things that I learned like early on when I joined the tech industry is so many people were experiencing burnout. And there's this just toxic culture of you need to be a 10x developer and you need to be working all day, every day to be able to get promoted or grow. Otherwise, you're just not going to get anywhere and you're not even going to get other jobs or other opportunities. And I just don't think that's the case. Yeah, mm. yeah. I, I think I really strongly agree with you there. And I think one of the damaging things it can do is like, when you do, then that influences your decision to get into tech. You're now in tech, you're a junior, and you're seeing everybody posting about getting in their six-figure salaries. Mm. And, and it makes you feel like you're not doing enough because mm. you're not doing that um, junior to tech lead in a year and a half. And Exactly. <sighs> yeah. Gosh, I remember when I was a grad we found out about somebody else that was a grad two years ago and was now a tech lead, like running the whole team. Wow. And we're like, oh, we need to be doing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, that's yeah, just yeah. how things are done. Yeah. And you're just putting so much pressure on yourself and doing the most for, for a job that even took you so much work to get into yeah, in the first place. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of stress, I think. And I think we do too much. And it's, I think it's about finding the balance between Telling people it's a good industry to be in. There are lots of benefits, lots of opportunities versus you need to remember that there are going to be struggles along the way and how can you best prepare and get ready for that? Yeah, that's a really good point. I yeah. think it's something that we see a lot. There tends to be like a massive, like you said, burnout rate and dropout from people who do go into engineering and then yeah. after just a few years decide it's not for them. And it's... It doesn't seem strange to me that, that, that that's related to the fact that we all expect it to be six figures instantly yeah. and like all of these great things that we see on social media. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I wonder, do you think there's anything we can do or how do you think we can change it so that we do give a more realistic perception of what it's like? 
Oh, I think that's so hard because, you know, if you go on YouTube right now, type in day in the life of a software engineer. <laughs> type in day in the life of a software engineer. It looks like they do nothing. It literally yeah. looks like they go to the office, right? right let me tell you what happens. <laughs> They'll go into the office. Ooh, let me get some breakfast, right? <laughs> they're munching on their breakfast. Ooh, let me go to stand up. They're going to stand up. Then they're talking about doing their two hours of working, lunch, ping pong, two hours of working. I saw when she's got like, she goes and get hot hot towels and goes to the spa. There are so many of them, right? I can't even windle them down to, to, to this detail. But it's just like, it looks like they're doing literally four hours of work, living their best life, going to work socials afterwards, and they're on six figures in Silicon Valley. It doesn't make any sense. And <laughs> it actually doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So it's so hard, like, because for me, I didn't know, I couldn't comprehend how someone could be coding every day. Mm. Like, I didn't, I couldn't comprehend how, what am I still adding to this website? Like, how do they need a front-end developer? Nine to five, Monday to Friday. I just didn't get it. Yeah. So I relied on those videos to give me, like, an insight into <laughs> what it was really like. And let me tell you something. I'm, I'm not living that life. No, no. <laughs> I'm not living true. that life. And so it's so hard that, because we all know that social media doesn't depict reality mm. but yet we still kind of rely on it to depict that reality yeah yeah so, yeah because yeah. it's just like how else am I meant to make like a, this a, that big decision to step into this role mm. and it's 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 just confusing it is it's it is so really confusing. confusing I think I need videos of people just like crying when their <laughs> PR just isn't that they, they can't get it like I just need to see like I just need to see people working from bed some days because I know that happens. That's yeah. True. yeah, 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 yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, the truth. Someone yeah. like looking at their test suite with just like head in hand. <laughs> literally, literally. And it's just like someone talking to their rubber duck because they have no one else to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I need to see some realness because I'm not seeing, I'm just seeing the highlight, yeah. the highlight reel, which is what social which, media what is. All, yeah. So it's like, do I, it's more of a question for me, like, do I, should I really look to social media mm. to, show, to depict to depict the truth when that's not what social media is for. Mm. Like social media is literally to show off the best parts of your life. Because we know that if someone literally takes pictures, like took a video of them crying because their, their code just doesn't work. <laughs> they don't know you get ripped to shreds. You get ripped to shreds. Just, you're doing this for attention. Like why are you crying? You're clearly not made for this role if you're crying, if your code yeah, that's, doesn't work. That's true. Like, yeah. that's true. And it's just like, what, what are we to do? It's true. Yeah. There's like no right answer. And even I'm guilty. I get so excited by the Google office. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> look at the gym. <laughs> look at the ping pong table. Look at all of like the sleep pods. <laughs> but. Do you um, get to nap? Yeah. I oh do regularly God. nap. But it's not all. It's, it's not, not all, all napping. games. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys have nap. We do. Have you to nap. You have your nap. To, to, to be fair, working from home, you've got your nap pod. Yeah, but it's not called a nap pod. It's <laughs> <laughs> not free breakfast. Like that's come true. On. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I just wish more people that were very active about the tech, the tech world, were also just as active about saying, but also I struggled with this thing, or mm. um, it's hard to get into, or like some of the realities. Not necessarily crying on the camera. But <laughs> <laughs> Like, it's always that. the drama with us. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see like the real like. Yeah, but I do think that people um, do speak a lot about imposter syndrome. To be fair, mm -hmm. like that's something that's discussed a lot. about. I think the two big, um, I want to say buzzwords because it's like I just always hear it is imposter syndrome yeah. and burnout. Yeah. Mm. People are normally over mark those things, but and Not there's like tech memes as yeah. well about like when you just don't know what's going on mm. and stuff. But I don't know. I just don't. I feel like. Because we're so in the tech space, like we see these things, it'd be much more interesting um, to find out from someone who doesn't know much about it and they're yeah. still like quite early on their journey. But then also, I think we've not been in tech for that long. Like, mm. I feel like this explosion of the day in the life of a software engineer and all this glamorization of tech, I don't feel like that's been around that long, has it? Has it? I don't I think I so. Know. But remember, I go really into detail when like, I'm into things. Yeah, but how many years ago? Like, it was literally three years ago. That's and not it long. Yeah, but still, That's like... true. When I started, I don't think <laughs> No, it. no, okay. But for, okay, so. <laughs> Let me go back a second. In my personal experience, remember, I wasn't in tech in 2020. Yeah, exactly. So I'm relying on these girls in 
Silicon Valley <laughs> showing me their best life. It was 2018, which was the year, I swear. 2018 was the year, day in the life. And because remember in 2020, everyone was like locked up. They would mm. let us out. Like mm. it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't giving, we're going to the Google office. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't as sexy as it was like pre-pandemic. In terms of the content that was coming out. Yeah, content. You know? And how did you find it, like, I guess, when you were doing your computer science degree, were, was this a type of content that you were consuming? No. Yeah, no. Like, that's a good question. I had no idea that the tech industry could be, like, all fun and games and sexiness. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. And I just, yeah. Even when I started my grad scheme, it was not glamorized in that way. I feel like, yeah, in the last few years, maybe five years, yeah, the yeah, day 100%. in the life of a software engineer started popping off and the American salaries were very different to the UK yeah. salary. Yeah. Still are. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like their day in the life is very different to ours. But mm. yeah, I only just started seeing them recently. Yeah, no, same. And do you think that the fact that there is that discrepancy between the UK and the US, like, does that ever play into an idea that you would ever want to relocate? Would you ever go to Google? in America? Oh, that's a very good question. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't think I would. I'm too much of a homebody. My family's here, Aww. so I want to be close enough <laughs> to see them. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I went to America recently on a work trip and it's just so, it's so different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a different life. Mm. It would take a lot for me to leave the UK, I think. I think I'd be the same. I don't think I'd want to go as far as the States. Mm. I'd stay, I'd go to Europe Look, baby, I'd, I'd be there. Like, <laughs> tell me where we're going, and I'm there. I'm like, Silicon Valley, <laughs> you'll see me there. <laughs> Honestly. Because remember, it's not forever. It could mm. literally just be for three months. I could do three months. Yeah, yeah literally. Yeah. Like, um, sometimes, like, what, what, like, holds me back from, like, actually relocating is that feeling that it's so permanent. Mm. Mm. Like, thinking, oh, like, almost like I see it as me being there forever. But it could just be for a cheeky two months. Mm. And I would love that. Yeah, but that's not where you're going to get the 200k yeah, full comp. I could get it for two two months. What, and, then t- <laughs> and then she's gone. She's gone, ladies and you're gentlemen. You're giving Tinder Swindler vibes. <laughs> this is where we'll stop. This is where we'll stop. <laughs> t- she called me a Tinder Swindler. <laughs> well, but you're a Google Swindler, I guess. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Jacob. Cut. <laughs> no, keep that in. It's actually hilarious. <laughs> oh gosh, that is brilliant. So thank you so much for joining us on Glowing in Tech for today. Yeah, it's been really great to have you and to hear all of your interesting perspectives from your journey. Mm. So yeah, thank, thank you for you. having me. It's been so nice. So how can we keep in contact? <laughs> um, I am most places Tara Ojo. I respond if you're trying to message me mostly to Instagram messages. Um, but you can also find my writing on Medium and I'm on Twitter as Tara underscore Ojo. Perfect. Perfect. And we will have all of those links in the show notes and all of the resources as well that you've mentioned, we will be putting in the show notes as well. So thanks so much, Tara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of the Glowing in Tech podcast. We hope that you enjoyed it. So next week we have a special guest and to find out who that is, follow us on socials at Glowing in Tech on Instagram, Twitter and TikTok. And also if you're listening on YouTube, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. If you're on Spotify, click on the bell so you can be notified every time we release a new episode. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. We'd love to hear your feedback. And yeah, see you next week.